each topic we're going to have a How Things Work segment. Today's is on fireworks. So, if you see a large hanging collection of firecrackers, I'm just so tempted to go over there and just light that. Well, you've seen that probably a few times, and we'll see it some more. Well, what's really inside one of those? Let's take a look. The difference between a firework and a hand grenade is the casing. The key thing is that we have an explosion. In a firework, it's typically something called flash powder, or before that, black powder. And I'll tell you the difference about those in a few minutes. Then you see that there's this clay plug. Basically, it's something to hold the pressure in. You see, when the flash powder or the gunpowder actually explodes, what happens is a solid turns into a gas, and that increases an enormous amount of pressure. You need that pressure to build up to a certain point, or you won't get the loud bang. So the clay plugs and the casing, which is always made out of cardboard, is what's needed to be able to build that pressure up until it explodes. If this was something dangerous, like a hand grenade, a pipe bomb, the casing would be made out of metal. And if the explosion was large enough, the metal fragments that would fly everywhere could really hurt people. I mean, that's sort of the point of a hand grenade. In fireworks, the little pieces of cardboard that blow out and the clay at the ends that blow out won't hurt you unless, of course, it's very close. And that's why you never light these things in your hands. I actually took a firework and cut it open once because I really wanted to see what was inside. And just like you saw in the diagram, you can see that we have the clay plugs, we have the fuse, we have a chamber where the flash powder would actually go, and of course a very thick casing. So when this actually explodes, you get a very large bang. The fireworks were brought to us from China. And in China, the very first recording of things that would make bangs were called bao zhu. That's spelled B-A-O-Z-H-U. It was a segment of bamboo. Have you ever looked at a bamboo cane, bamboo fishing pole? It's in segments, and each of those segments is sealed. And if you took one of those segments and you tossed it in a fire, if you got it just right, the water vapor inside that chamber would heat up, heat up, and expand, and the thing would blow up like a firecracker. Of course, if you didn't get it quite right, maybe the bamboo would start on fire, burn through, and you wouldn't get a bang at all. But that was the first recorded time, and this was way back in 200 BC. So a fascination with exploding bamboo led through the ages to the first recorded use of fireworks, which is 7th century China. And in 9th century China, a very important invention, the invention of black powder, of gunpowder. Now, gunpowder is 75% potassium nitrate, 15% charcoal, and 10% sulfur. And this is by weight. You might say potassium nitrate, that seems like an odd thing to just have on hand in uh, the 800s. Well, you see, this can be still distilled from bat guano, bat poop. Go to some cave, you got a whole bunch of bats live there, you got this white stuff lining the the grounds of the cave where the bats have been for probably thousands of years. You scrape it up, you got yourself some potassium nitrate. Who first figured out? You take this stuff, you mix it with some charcoal, you know, half burnt wood, an oxygen starved environment, some sulfur, you dig up from some sulfur springs, this yellow crusty stuff, mix it up like this together, stick it inside some clay shell or other type of plug, maybe a piece of bamboo, you put clay in on the end, throw that in the fire, 
and you got yourself a big bang. You see, what happens is that all three of these things are solids. But when you combust them, when you rearrange the molecules together, they make products like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen, right? Nitrous oxides, and oh, I don't know, two or three or some number here. All of these are gases. And this reason you have 75% of this is it's the thing that carries the oxygen. So all of the compounds that get combined, the more stable states, are gases. Since the gases have, of course, much more pressure than the solids, there's a 10,000 to 1 expansion just turning the same amount of substance from a solid to a gas. That builds up this huge pressure, and the thing explodes. So for many years, black powder was used in fireworks, and it was also used, of course, for ammunition, for guns, for putting the black powder into something and not making a completely enclosed case like a bomb, but rather a propellant to shoot out a bullet eventually. And before that, to have shells explode, an instrument of war. Black powder is dangerous. I would not suggest you go try to make it. In fact, modern fireworks, or even since the 1900s, what people use instead of black powder, which can be very dangerous, very volatile, something called flash powder. Now, flash powder is the silvery stuff you see. If you ever open up a firecracker and you see this silvery, very silvery color stuff inside, the reason it's that color is because it's 30% aluminum maybe 10 micron size flakes with a lot of surface area. And the other ingredient, and there's only one, is 70% potassium chlorate. Probably easier to get than the bat guano potassium nitrate. But the same principle is here. This carries oxygen, and it will combine with the aluminum into the one of the most absolutely stable elements that exists. Aluminum oxide, alumina, the outside coating of every aluminum can, which you can't help but get, because if you expose aluminum to the air, it will turn into this extremely stable compound. When something goes to an extremely stable compound, of course, that means there's a lot of energy to be given off. You have to have that energy balance, and when you have that, that excess energy, of course, goes into the motion of the particles, heat, and the other product that's made here is potassium chloride. Now that's a salt, that's also a solid, and you're saying, so where in this case is this conversion to a gas? Well, so much heat is given off that this potassium chloride is actually hot enough to be a gas. And your fireworks still go bang without the use of black powder, which could be very dangerous. Flash powder. The thing that makes it even less dangerous is the limit of the amount of the flash powder that is allowed to be in a given firework. Long ago, there were these things when I was a kid called M80s. And they had something like, oh, two and a half grams of flash powder in them they could make really big explosions. They looked something like this, maybe just a little bit bigger than this. But this isn't allowed anymore as any type of consumer firework. Now, the biggest firecracker you're allowed to buy in the United States has 0.05 grams. But everyone still wants to buy an M80, so what they did is they take a tiny little firecracker with this much in it, and they pot it in a huge amount of clay uh, so that you still get a bigger bang, not a big enough one to blow up a mailbox, but a bigger bang because you have all that pressure held in for a longer amount of time. So, so far we've been talking about firecrackers, basically, things that just make bangs. What about fireworks, things that make the beautiful displays in the sky? 
Well, here we have a couple more elements. First, it has to get up in the air. So you usually put some shell like this, a mortar shell, into a tube. When you put it into a tube and you light the fuse, it will immediately blow up this lift charge. Basically, you've made a model rocket. Because you have the outside tube, and because this is at the bottom, the hot gases that are released propels the shell up into the air. You also notice that there's this timer fuse. The lift charge lights the back of this timer fuse, but it's a very slow burning fuse. The white thing you see in there is an insulator, and it's the green part that's actually a fuse on fire. And it's timed by its length to be the right amount so when that shell gets to the maximum part and before it starts falling down, you should get to the end of that fuse. When you get to the end of the fuse, you notice it will light the burst charge. Basically, this is still a whole bunch of flash powder that makes an explosion. That explosion does two things. One, each of these little stars, and that's the fun part, gets set on fire. Good. And because these stars are lined up on the shell on the outside of this, those stars go out in a circular pattern. Each of the stars is not simply flash powder, but it's a substance that burns mixed with a particular metal or compound that gives off a specific color. So when those things are on fire and they're being propelled outward by this burst charge, they make the long, beautiful lines of color that you see in a firework. Sometimes each of those little stars is itself a tiny shell so that the shell is burst out and then inside that shell it's lit and it makes its own bang. And that's why sometimes you don't just see these balls of color going out, but sometimes at the very end of these, these will also produce some kind of pretty burst. It's very interesting to actually look into one of these in person. So I took a, uh, a rocket here, okay, and uh, cut it open. And if we look closely inside, you can see that we have our propellant, our lift charge here. And then at the very top of the rocket are a whole bunch of these stars, the things that will have the different colors that will actually produce the burst when we are up in the air. And the pretty little plastic nose cone is just sort of to give it some aerodynamics and make it look like a rocket going off. But it's really just a lift charge that then lights these, which will then, just because the whole thing is moving up, produce some plume going up into the air. Here's an illustration of the different colors. And by adding different compounds to the small little stars that are responsible for these trails of light as they burn or as they burst here, you can get a large variety of colors. You might wonder, well, who first figured this out? I bet that was a lot of fun. Hey, let's put this in something and see what color it gets. Ah, I didn't get any color. Let's try this. Let's try this. Certainly was trial and error. And this was in the 7th and 9th century in China. It took a long time for the knowledge of these types of fireworks to reach the West. There was a Jesuit priest that went to China in the uh, late 1750s, and he observed not only these wonderful, colorful firework displays, but also was able to talk to the people making them. He eventually went back to Europe, and when he was in France, he wrote a manuscript a published scientific paper. It took about five years for this whole process to go. But in 1763, an uh, article was written in a scientific journal explaining how to do this. And it didn't take too long after that till people in the West were also making the fireworks types of displays. Today, in the US, a given firework is limited to 500 grams of the explosive material, the flash powder. Those are not the kind of fireworks you want to hold in your hand. 
because clearly they make very large explosions and very beautiful displays. That's what you need to know about fireworks.